Good afternoon. The nights are beginning to draw in because it's October very, very soon. And you know what that means. It can only be one thing. It's time for Plank of the Week. Welcome back to this week's edition of Plank of the Week. And I kid you not, we've had an awful lot of planks in an awful lot of weeks, but this, I think, may beat them all. And I'm delighted to say that we are in a beautiful new studio, uh, which has been made uh, at great expense by News UK. And I'm also delighted to introduce to you two people who, incredibly, haven't ever been on Plank of the Week. The first to my left is Tonya Buxton, um, super celebrity chef, mother, businesswoman, um, woman about town, I suppose I should say. I like all of those titles. Richard Tice, leader of the Reform UK party, a man with his own show on talk radio, uh, uh, almost uh, a media mogul, you could say, <laughs> in some description. But welcome to both of you, and thank you for joining us in this very first fantastic Plank studio. It's great to be here. I mean, it's amazing. I was always a bit worried that I might be a victim of being Plank <laughs> because of those two, actually. Well, I mean, I suppose you were probably ruled out from that because of the rules during elections. You're not allowed to be named <laughs> at any point during election campaigns. But, you know, I think we should give Tonya the first dibs for uh, who Plank your first nomination is. Now, I know you both probably watched it before. You're basically going to nominate three people. We're going to get them down to one. We're going to choose the final person. But this week has been unbelievable, hasn't it? I mean, there were so many. It was really hard mm. to break them down to just three. Yes. But I do think think that Angela Rayner has to be considered Plank of the Week. Angela and I, Rayner. She, I mean, unbelievable. I've got to read out. I'm going to, just so I don't get her words wrong. Yes. I'm just going to read this out, because this is what she thinks is going to get the, the red line, the, the Labour voters, the true working-class Labour voters mm. back. This is what she thinks. We cannot get any worse than a bunch of scum, homophobic, racist, misogynistic, absolute pile of banana republic, vile, nasty, Etonian, posh piece of scum. OK. Charming. Charming. That's what she said. So uh, you've got to bear in mind that I'm a, an immigrant's daughter and my parents came over and, you know, did the British dream in many ways. They came over literally with nothing. My mother came over at 14 with a bag of clothes. And my father came over to study. Unfortunately, he, he couldn't afford to, so they've just worked and worked and worked. And they were ne not really political people, but they, through an ideology, they decided to vote Conservative because that was the people that were helping them get ahead as right. business people. You know, they weren't academics. They, they weren't going to go into, you know, the public service. They wanted to do their own businesses. Right. It worked out. So this woman is calling my hard-working parents kind, beautiful people scum. Tax-paying. Tax-paying every penny. Yeah. I mean, She's calling them scum. And she thinks that's OK. She thinks that's great. Mm. So, so this is the real conundrum here. Was she just appealing to the activist base who go to the Labour Party Who were cheering her on, by the way. Who were Quite cheering on. Indeed, indeed, someone, I think, actually, if you listen carefully to the clip, was actually encouraging her to go a bit further. Yeah. So was she appealing to them? Was she just working on the basis that I'm going to create some controversy because that'll get me in the news mm. and that'll help my sort of leadership uh, contest? Um, uh, she certainly wasn't thinking about, couldn't have been thinking about targeting voters. And I wonder whether she's naive or just doesn't get, actually, voters don't like being called scum, particularly if they've just voted for the first mm. time for the Conservatives. Absolutely. So she was calling ex-Labour voters who voted for the Conservatives, who she's trying to win back. Mm. She's calling them scum. I think she might have... I know that, that there's this kind of northern thing, cos I'm... I'm yeah, but I British know loads sport. of people in the north, and, and you've campaigned yeah. in Hartley. Yeah. I stood you up. Know I've the got eleven thousand votes in Hartley. Yeah, no, well. I mean, you've probably spoken to more people more recently yeah. than I have in those parts of, the, of Britain called the north, right? And they've all said to me, "This is rubbish." You know, northern people are not any more rude than people from the south. It's no, absolute nonsense. Actually, I've, I've and they don't go around opposite. calling each other scum. No, I've had the opposite. When I've gone up north, I, I find people are really friendly and really kind yeah. and gentle, and just have a, a, a decent worth work ethic. Yeah. and uh, the and kind they call you love and things. Like they that, call you they? love, and it's like being, you know, back in Cyprus yeah. for me no, because I'm, there's a warmth there. The, and that's exactly the experience I, I had. We, you know, we, locked on, we knocked on tens of thousands of doors, and we had that real warmth. Even in the cold of December, people were opening the door, having a chat, and I got almost no abuse. 
Um, it would be far worse, frankly, in, it's great, in, in some it, parts when you, of, say, of when you speak as a, as a political campaigner and you go, <laughs> I got almost no abuse. It was a real <laughs> that's result. A, <laughs> that's, a real result. <laughs> that's a strange thing. Well, what was really interesting also is that she did that kind of glossy thing um, for the Times newspaper and the magazine, you know, talking about her difficult oh, is, upbringing. You know, I don't believe half of this stuff, by mm. the way. You know where she made out that she was fed dog food by her mother? Yes, I don't... Because her mother couldn't read. read yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I mean, there's a big picture of a dog on the can of dog food. <laughs> that, that, you don't that, that go, was... I can't read, I think this might be good for humans. No, it's a picture of a dog. That wasn't the point for me. The point for me is that she uh, said that she's supporting Kia. Well, I mean, who would support Kia? But she was supporting Kia. Sure she is. And yet... You're sure she is. Yeah, yeah. And yet, here she did this really glossy makeover with the red lips yeah, yeah. and everything and talked about her, her very difficult childhood and why it's made her uh, a better politician. Yeah. And then she comes out and she abuses the people that she's trying to turn to vote for mm. her. I mean, what Listen, I, I've actually slightly... And I know this will sound a bit weird because I should, probably shouldn't have, but I have a slight, slight admiration for where she's come from. And the Absolutely. And fought her way out of a very difficult... Yeah. situation where her parents were clearly not very good parents and I get all that but I think part of it as well for her uh, is that she doesn't understand that when you're a politician you're paid by the public your only income comes from us that we the taxpayers provide you with and if you want to you know charge a pair of you know apple earbuds I to us I think uh, 250 right. travel first class on a train yeah you know you've been a bit of a hypocrite to be yeah. honest I think that's right and you know if Keir Starmer doesn't survive she is clearly right up there as one of the top two or three likely contenders, yeah. and I think this may come back actually to bite mm. her. I really do. Yeah, because, because she did apologise, didn't she, when she called a Tory MP scum in the House of Commons? Yes. yes. She was and asked she's, to. Yeah. she's clearly not going to apologise this time around. Yeah. And, yeah, I, I think this may come back to haunt her. She, I think short-term she's created the news, she's, she's looked like the newsworthy mm. figure, you know, strong and courageous and all that. Uh, but I, I really do think that, in the same way that you know, some of Boris's previous articles and comments yeah. constantly come back to yes. haunt him. Yeah. I think this could be the same with Yes, uh, I think that's Andrew true. Rainer. So, Richard, what have you got to counter that one? Well, I think, having uh, attacked a Labour politician, I think it's only appropriate and fair that we target a senior figure in the Conservative Party. Indeed, um, apparently, the Prime Minister, <laughs> although it's... I, I think, actually, it's unclear, because he went to the United Nations and thought that people all over the world... Um, understand and are familiar with Kermit the Frog. The well, to be fair, more of them have probably heard of Kermit the Frog than have of Boris Johnson, haven't they? Well, I wonder. Um, who knows? But this was an extraordinary speech. And not only did he start banging on about a Muppet, and frankly, I think he is the <laughs> Muppet. <laughs> prize Muppet. No one else. <laughs> Absolutely. He is a prize Muppet. Maybe there's a bonus prize today, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> but seriously, Muppet of the week. Um, he, he then had the, the cheek to say that going green was easy. Mm in the very week that s almost 70 million people in Britain have discovered that going green is a nightmare. Yes. We've got an energy crisis, we've got a pricing crisis of our energy, mm. and then all of a sudden we've got a fuel crisis. So he says going green's easy. He then had the cheek to say that it's also lucrative. Yeah. I mean, how out of touch can you be to think that it's lucrative when literally, as he spoke those words, millions of people are getting energy bills through their doors saying in October and November, your bill is going to go up hundreds and hundreds of mm. pounds. So what it was lucrative for was his mates, yeah. mm -hmm. his big donors, yeah. big business, the overseas-owned energy groups that own the, the renewables and all yeah. this. It may well be lucrative for them, but it's not lucrative and also, for tens of millions of pounds. Can anyone explain why it is that in Europe, apparently, prices of energy are going down while ours are going up? How is that working? Uh, it's very simple, because... Uh, they've got themselves properly organised. They've got um, they've got contingency supplies of gas, mm. uh, and they're not as reliant. I mean, you look at France. You know, France has got buckets right. of, of cheap energy, right. uh, electricity. We haven't because we basically outsourced everything. Mm. We even outsourced the storage of yes. the emergency gas that we might need in the event of a hiccup right. to the nice people in the Netherlands. Right. The thing with Boris, though, the thing that gets me gets me most is, as I said, I'm the non-political person here. I've, I've been dragged from food and beautiful restaurants into politics. Yes. And You're really good at it, though. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, but So I, initially watching Boris, you do end up kind of voting for someone and trusting someone for their personality. But he, he's bipolar. He, he came across as someone who was... who, who had great character and he was amusing, but actually was a libertarian and that was very much for the people. But he's turned out no, to be the worst be... kind of man because mm. it's all about let's be very, money let's, for mates. Let's be very clear. Boris is not for the people. Boris 
is for Boris. Yes. He yeah. cares about nobody he's else. He's already now he started getting glare like, hasn't he? He started talking about his legacy. He doesn't he care about to be in for yeah, long He doesn't care about his children. He doesn't yeah. care oh. about his family. He cares about Boris. And and so it went on this week. And then literally in the last few days, I mean, we've got we've got queues down the streets. You know, people can't get fuel, you can't get to work. And who is our Prime Minister? Mm. It's like we forgot he's gone completely and utterly. AWOL. Yes, and he's missing, using the conference at the Labour Party in Brighton as the excuse, isn't he? They're putting out this line saying, oh, well, we have a normal sort of truce period. Yeah, well, that's fine he, when we don't have an actual emergency the, going on. He's but the he, leader you know. of the country and we've got a national emergency and, you know, he needs to calm people down in the mm. same way that Tony Blair did when there was last a fuel crisis yeah. 21 years ago. Yes. Yeah, well, do you know, it's good because that brings it on to my first nomination and some of you may be listening to this and watching this actually in complete disagreement with me because a lot of people have been blaming the media, a lot of people have been blaming Grant Shapps, a lot of people have been blaming, you know, Boris and the, and the situation with energy and all of that. I'm going to blame the people that actually went to get fuel, the people that actually queued up when they didn't need to to get petrol that they didn't need. Because there was no fuel shortage. There was no reason to go and get fuel if you didn't need it. But because old uh, uh, Grant Shapp said, don't panic, everybody immediately panicked. And we had a ridiculous situation, like we had when people were buying up all the toilet roll and but the pasta. Mike, you know, they thought, oh, my God, better, better fill the car up. Why? Mike, we've had 18 months, nearly two years of propaganda from the press mm. into our heads. So people are not their normal selves. And there's something called the psychology of scarcity, mm. which is working better on people because we've had so much fear mongering over the past 18 months that this was just another, it's like, you know, when you kind of pre um, record or pre program a person, mm. that's what's happened to the British public and actually the global public in the sense that they've been pre programmed to just tap into fear, tap into things. So as soon as they hear something that's going to frighten them, they run from the petrol stations. So I personally completely and utterly blame the media for doing this. Yeah, but you they... can't, because surely Yes, people, I can, and I surely, am. Like, I know you can, and you are, and I, <laughs> I completely accept that, but this is why I thought you might argue with me. <laughs> but I just think that, you know, we are still people of free will. I mean, I don't yeah. buy this thing that everybody... But you but I think don't I... undermine the, the psychological damage that's been done over That's these past the point, 18 because months. trust. We all grew up to trust the government. Yeah. And when, I didn't. When it, when it, I never trusted any government, ever. Oh, interesting. You know, I, I, think I it was really a, did. It was a sort of... I, I think it's most people's foundation, you're told to trust the government. Uh, and when something, some words come out of a cabinet minister's lips, mm. historically that used to mean something. We now, mean, we now know that actually, under this government, it basically means the opposite. And that's the reason mm. panic, people panic. Because the moment you had Grant Shapps or Kwasi Kwarteng saying, there's no shortage, there's no cause well, for immediate concern. Well, my favourite one is Kwasi Kwarteng saying, the lights will not go out over the winter. Yeah, so, I mean, you know that's going to happen. So, so, so when, when, uh, when a cabinet minister says... Um, you know, don't panic, there's no problem with mm. fuel. You know, quite right, there's clearly a problem with fuel. And the first Except thing you there wasn't, though. But the but only there reason there that's became it. a problem with fuel was because all these numpties but, went out and decided to fill but, their cars. But, but that's because people have become... They've become to realise that you cannot trust a single word this government says. Whereas if that was the opposite, if people says, ah, oh, soothing words from a cabinet minister, no problem. But actually, right. so, so I, I, I'm afraid for that reason... I struggle with that. Okay. I think that's a bit well, hard. Well, listen, you don't have to agree with me. I mean, if you all agreed at the same time, it'd be hopeless, wouldn't it? But how about this? Go around the other way, right? If the British people were not so malleable, maybe the government would have had so much success in the first place. I completely and that's, agree. And that's the other problem, right? I, I agree with I that. Because I think there's a real problem in this country, and it's not just in this country, but we've sort of in, imported it, I think, a bit from America. But everybody wants everything now. You know, and this has been a bit of a theme for me these last few days, where, you know, you go into the supermarket and there's about 55 different versions of everything. Yes. And you don't need 55 different versions of everything. And I know that it's going to sound like I'm an old duffer talking about the good old days. But in the 1970s, when I grew up, you, know, you didn't have 55 different varieties of anything. No, you're absolutely you had right. one it's, thing that you could get. If you wanted exactly. potatoes, you could get those potatoes uh, or no potatoes. And you, but the thing you didn't is... get, like, you know, Charlotte potatoes, new potatoes, chip potatoes, mashed potatoes, you know... Just get some potatoes. And you'd make do. Yeah. Yes. And you'd think a little bit. And that, that's the problem is that, that uh, in particular, I keep going on about the last 18 months, people have stopped being able to think for themselves and do for themselves. See, I don't think that's right. I think that you may have a point about that, but I, but, but I think this country was always a bit like that. There was always a bit I, of hoarding. I think there's, there's an element people of... People love hoarding. Yeah, there's an element of decadence about having so much choice, you become used to it, mm -hmm. without question. That's a sort of... It's like a sort, almost like a sort of the... We've become so decadent. Mm. Uh, and, like, if and you can't get therefore, it delivered tomorrow, it's yes, a problem. Yes, and you become decadent you know. and complacent and wasteful. And I think that is a real issue. Mm. But also, the truth is that, again, it comes back to trust in the government. 
The government told you to be scared, and so people were scared. Mm. Yes, because you... I believe, well, see, I don't get that, because that's not me, so I, no, I can't but, understand... No, but up, like until, we... up until recently, I thought that in order to, to govern, to be a governor of people, that you had to have certain moral standing, and one of the most basic things is that you would tell the truth. Now... That's been obliterated for me. I now don't believe anything that's said. I, I feel, and I feel very saddened by yeah, this. It, and it's really serious, because the moment you lose trust in a government uh, and respect for the civil service and respect for the police, who, who've been, they're all being badly led. That's the bottom yes. line. Yeah. And leadership is the key here. Mm. You know, as a nation, we've achieved extraordinary things over the decades and the centuries mm. with real leadership and people like strong bold leadership mm. even if they're a bit uncertain about oh, yeah. certain things you know you think what we've achieved it just in the last hundred years in the in the two yeah. world wars but I, to be honest, i would say i don't think we've had proper honest to goodness decent leadership since margaret thatcher i don't think we have john major look what happened to him you know the back to basics campaign yes no he, he was every weak. single one of but his actually, cabinet I ministers think, um, was not doing that uh, family values i think many people might say that tony blair uh, inspired some confidence. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, I think actually... Until Iraq. Until Iraq. Yeah. And, and, then, and then that was the turning point. Yeah. But until then, you think, you know, his speech after Princess Diana was, you know, tragically died, you know, he did actually inspire. And there was a sort of uh, a millennial sort of enthusiasm. And then it went wrong. And, yes. and that was... Oh, listen, sort of it was very was inspirational sort of... the day that he was leading himself and his family into part into Downing Street. But then we discovered that everyone who was there was a member of the Labour Party. And, you know, initially everyone thought, oh, isn't it great? A young man with young children in Downing yeah. Street, it's a bit like the Kennedys, isn't it marvellous? You know, turned out it was a bit like the Kennedys, yeah. completely and utterly, you know, corrupt and not very nice behind the scenes. It, 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 exactly. Uh, so, you know, but, but I think we, we, we have been badly led mm. and it's got worse and worse. And yeah. that's the extraordinary thing. And people, you know, but Johnson likes to think that he's like Churchill, but <laughs> nothing could be further no. than the truth. Yeah. I had uh, some experience with him. Uh, during the, the Brexit shambles right. in late 2018. And what I discovered is far from being brave, actually he is a weak, cowardly man mm. uh, who, who doesn't like taking decisions, right. uh, doesn't like leading from the front. He, he's, he's a blustering salesman mm. uh, and, and, in a sense... He doesn't people... want to be there when you take delivery of the goods. And, uh, it, but I also read, uh, gather, he doesn't read things. So, he, he, you know, he gets these kind of memos and, and he's a headline reader. So he doesn't... In, if he's going to rule on something, you'd mm. expect him to do the all-nighters reading yes. and finding out the, uh, the information he needs to the, rule on it. The reason he's been so successful, of course, is because actually we all love a salesman. Yeah. And uh, he's a very good salesman. Yeah. And I think also... Um, he's got so many frailties that all of us see one of our own frailties somewhere in Boris. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, certainly the people that voted for him in, in, in those Red Bull seats in the North would much rather vote for him than somebody like Angela Rayner, who's from the North, you know, yeah. so go figure. Anyway, your time for your number two. So my nomination is, it was going to be individual people, but actually it's the whole of SAGE. Mm. It's all of them. I haven't spoken about them for a while. Have it's almost not? like I was hoping they'd gone away. No, <laughs> but they haven't. they've not They're gone away. They're still there. They're still around. Still I think there. so. Um, that just... bloke, Neil Ferguson. I mean, Neil Ferguson oh. and his wrong predictions. Yeah. Should we just remind ourselves? Yes. I'm sorry, I'm not Let's good at memorising, so I'll be there. Let's do so that. these are predictions that Neil Ferguson has said that have been wrong so far. Um, he was behind the disputed research that sparked musk, the musk culling of 11 million sheep yep. at the time. Remember that. He predicted that up to 150,000 people would die there were 200 deaths. Right. In uh, 2002, he predicted that 50,000 people would be likely to die of BSE, mad cow's disease, in beef in the UK, and there were only 177 deaths. He, in 2009, he estimated uh, that there would the reasonable worst case scenario was that swine flu would lead to 65,000 British deaths. In the end, swine flu killed 457 people. It's amazing, isn't it? So this guy is always wrong. Always he is wrong. always, always wrong. And yet here we are, still following his predictions mm. and everything that he does, and all the lies they put up these kind of charts and stuff that give you those worst case scenario. Mm. And so, especially for the second lockdown. Yeah. We lock down on horrible fear and lies, and then they've adjusted them. The government yeah. have adjusted those figures. So this adjustment, these, the language that's used drives me nuts because they're lying. Mm. So they should come out and say, we lied to you because we wanted to fool you and trick you to, yes. to do whatever... Dust Why can't they even just come do? out and say, we made a mistake, we got it wrong? And, and they haven't and, even done and, that. And I think uh, she's a member of uh, SAGE, is uh, Susan Mickey, of oh, course, that's is, right. a, the is, is a... The uh, communist. She's the communist. Yeah. So why can't they actually declare their interest mm. in this and say, exactly. actually, 
Um, we're not just a scientist. You know, we're an active member of the Communist Party, and we think that the UK should yeah. be run. Also, I uh, also a, don't it, count it, these behavioural scientists way. as scientists. I was just going to say they're that. Not they're not a scientist. No. I mean, they're about as much of a scientist as I am. They're dodgy you psychologists. Know, I did yeah. physics yeah. O level. Exactly. You know, I know which way gravity works. You know, I can make a ripple tank work. You know, I, that's all they've ever done. The rest of it is all psychology. Yeah. But if you right? so, if you look at how many people are in Sage, and how many of them are these behavioural scientists, mm. so they're manipulative people. Yeah. The, then you have to take it further back. So I know I've put Sage as my planks of the week. Yes. But the real question is, is who decided that we would take our advice from Sage? Because that's the da 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 mm. da. Yeah. That is the question that I ask every week. Yes. Pretty much every week I, I ask you every well, single I, week. Well, and I and, and I we believe, don't and I don't worry you, Richard, but I believe very firmly that actually this is not the first time that governments have used these people in order to make policy. I think they've been using them for a long time. Because if you remember back to the days when Chris Whitty and others, when they were just chief medical officer, and you'd see a story in the Telegraph, yes. it would say, drink one glass of red wine a month and you'll be fine. And then the next week it would be, you know, drink two glasses of white wine a week and you'll be fine. And that was the kind of advice they would give out, yeah. you know, sort of behavioral I think it's, advice. I think it's, it's one of those quangos that's always been there, sort of quietly in the background. Yeah. Most of the time doing not a lot, and unfortunately no one's ever heard of it. Right. And then all of a sudden, they're up there in lights. They are the science, right. when we all know that actually scientists disagree as much as economists disagree yes. and as much as journalists disagree. Yes. Um, so there's no such thing as the science. Mm. And then, of course, what happens was these dreadful people from Sage, they all suddenly started rocking up mm. um, on the radio, on yeah. TV, yeah. and rather liking the limelight. Oh, yes, they and, do. Uh, and then, I've course, never heard that one, I'm proud came, to say. Uh, and the other, well, the other funny thing is, is they always appear and say, and make the presenter say, oh, and he's appearing in a personal capacity. Yeah. Well, why are you appearing then? Yeah. Exactly. If you're in a personal capacity, I'm not interested. Yeah. If you're and there from Sage, then fine. And, and who's paying who? Right. And That's the big one. The, and, That's and the what, big one. What, and this, I think, really worries me, because mm. the truth is they're on the same merry-go-round of research grants, non-exec directorships, mm -hmm. of universities, you know, professorships, quangos. Big um, bucks. Big pharma. And it's a complete merry-go-round, yeah. as long as you basically are part of that consensus set, all, which is all around Imperial College. Uh, and, and if you're part of the Oxford set, then you're persona non grata. They seem a bit more sensible, I, the Oxford can, lot. You know, the MPs um, have to, dis to show where they get all their money from. Yes. So, and, and if register you become, of interest. Re register your interest. But if you become a minister, mm. you also have to, to put your family's interests as well. Right. So I believe that SAGE should be... Have, have to disclose everything, where they get all their money from, all their interests, yes. and then we would be able to understand, you know, whether they should be doing that job or not. I think most of the people that are on say it should not be there. They should be not. No. They're not advising the government, and definitely not advising me what to do with my children. No, I think it's absolutely right. It'd be very interesting to see whether any of them got any tie-ups with vaccine companies, for example, uh, or tie-ups oh, with anything else. Have. You know, wouldn't um, that be yeah. interesting? The, the, there's no question that the um, it, it's even the expectation. So even if they haven't today you know when this drama's over yeah. uh, that some of them are going to be appointed to non-exec boards of, yeah. of, of parts of some of Big Pharma or some of the big universities. It's yeah. all... You know, you scratch it's all my connected. Back. Yeah, you scratch my back, yeah. I'll scratch yours. And, and that's how... That's how that world operates. Mm. But also, and it stinks. Also, the way that they have negated honest and decent scientists who come up with a different opinion. Yeah. Like you said, there is no such thing as the science. The science is something open for discussion. Yeah. And yet you've got fantastic people like Sunita Gupta um, who have a different opinion, yeah. a different view of how we should have dealt with Of this. how it should have been dealt with, well, yeah. But we know that, for, that we've never before had lockdowns as a way of t treating a pandemic. I no. mean, in all the pandemic researching that they've done, that's never happened. So why did this mm. happen? I know. It's a very good point. Richard, who's your second nominee? So, having had the uh, the leader of the Conservative Party, I think, yes. you know, again, I like to be fair. I'm a fair I've man. Say, I've, I say that so, to people about you. They so don't believe a word I, of it, you know, but uh, <laughs> I constantly tell so them. So, of course, I have to put forward uh, Sir Keir Starmer. Sir Keir. I mean, he has had the weekend <laughs> from who knows where, right. but a very bad place. I well, mean, I mean, how it is started... it possible, right? How is it possible for a guy to lead the opposition and still be behind this government in the opinion poll? It is quite extraordinary. Right? <laughs> Actually, it's quite extraordinary. Would, would Jeremy Corbyn be in a better or worse place than... Oh, no. than um, who knows? But literally, Sir Keir Starmer, I mean, he's fiddling around with a bunch of electoral process stuff on yeah. Saturday that no one's interested in. We've got a fuel crisis, we've got an energy crisis, right. and he's banging on about, you know, how to get voted. Oh, and by the way, if you'd followed my suggestion at the last leadership contest, only I would have qualified to apply, and then yeah. well, it would have been a leadership contest at one. So, I mean, that was just nuts. Right. That was Saturday. Crazy. And then on Sunday, 
I mean, I don't know what he had for breakfast, you know, but he clearly didn't have a proper Weetabix. No. Because uh, he gets on the Andrew Marr show and he should have been prepared for a very gentle question from Andrew yeah. Marr uh, when he said, uh, is it um, so, uh, so secure, is it, uh, is it transphobic to say that only women have a, cer a cervix? Mm. And he was completely unprepared yeah. for it. And he was it spluttering come. around. <laughs> and then he sort of says, well, it's sort of something that, 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 that shouldn't be said. It's, it's not right. right. I mean, really? Yeah. What biology but class this is did the thing, he right? And I said this to somebody today. Um, Andrew Marshall have then said, well, if you think it's wrong to say it, what, what exactly is wrong with it? Yeah. He didn't ask him that question. And th there are so, ma there are so many responses that Sakir could have given, mm. but actually he gave the worst of all worlds. Yeah. And literally, I mean, I always talk about what are his likely supporters, wherever they are in the country, mm. potential supporters, what are they chatting about? I mean, do you really think that people in the pubs of, pubs of Hartlepool are chatting about, uh, you know, the trans issues, uh, all of this stuff? No. no. They're not. The gender identity issue. I mean, I have just to say, not interested. one of the funniest things I've heard about all of this was James Whale's show last night, right? I was listening to him and Ash, and if you haven't heard it before, it's incredibly dry, very amusing. Uh, and they started talking about this cervix issue, right? And Ash said, well, you know, you can you probably get one. You can get almost anything nowadays. If you want, you know, if you don't have one, you could probably get one. And it was just, it showed how ridiculous the whole issue is. And I know that there are people who will say, oh, you're being insensitive, you know, to trans men or trans women. But, you know, to be honest, as you say, it's not something that people talk about. I just think we've had so I mean, so I can define what a woman is, I think. I right? Agree. You can. Yeah, I think My so. point is, and it's exactly the same as yours, Richard, is that we've had so much on our plate. There's so much to worry about and, you know, and deal with in our families, in, in, our, in our livings, in making ends meet and sorting all these things out. And I, and I have great empathy with trans people, but I just don't want to talk about mm. it. It's not, it's not my argument. And, it's, and like you said, the people in the pub, when I sit down with my girlfriends or I go out with the family, that's not the, the thing we're talking about because it doesn't affect us. Whereas we want, I want fairness and kindness to all. And unfortunately, Absolutely. if you decide to say one thing or the other on this argument, and I don't because I don't want to go there, I don't need the grief that you get if you join the trans argument, yeah. um, it, it ends up being nasty. And that's what I'm upset about, mm. because all I want is everybody to have a fair and kind life. Yes. And well, so it, that's what he should have it's said. It's quite clear there's not much fairness and kindness in the Labour Party. No. But, but the they're all trying to kill is, each other in look, Brighton. I mean, there's only been half of them who can come home, aren't they? Look, we all have um, empathy. People can identify, frankly, however they want. Yeah. And, you know, we all respect that, and that's absolutely fine. But please don't keep banging on about it, mm -hmm. ramming it down no. our throat, day in, day out, week in, week no. out, when actually... Decent millions of ordinary families up and down the country are working out. Can I get to see a GP? Can mm. I pay the energy bills yeah. this winter? My hip hurts. Have I got any when, petrol? When's yeah. it going to be <laughs> operated on? Yeah. And goodness me, I can't even get to work because I can't get any fuel. Those are the important mm. issues that everybody is focusing on. 99.999% yeah. of the population. Yeah. And that's frankly what leaders of the Labour Party should be focusing mm. on. And leaders of the, of the, of the government and nothing else. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. And maybe when the Tories have their conference next week, they won't be hidebound by well, all of that nonsense, and maybe they'll fix something. They'll be worrying about the conference that's going on in the same city just down the street. Oh, that's my conference. Oh, Sorry. really? There you go. <laughs> Excellent plan. Well, we may have to pay you a visit. Um, my next nomination uh, is from the BBC, uh, Mr Tim Davey. Uh, who is, of course, the new Director General, brought in uh, to be a new brush to, to make a clean sweep of all of the nonsense that's been going on at the BBC. Um, and he's decided uh, that he's had a good look around. Uh, he hasn't changed anything at all about Gary Lineker's salary, really. Hasn't changed anything at all about the, his ability or inability to make judgments on uh, Twitter about things which are politics. He's still allowed to do that. Um, he's still wasting loads and loads of money. And he's also had his best idea yet, which is give himself a pay rise of 75 grand. Now, most people in this country don't even make... 75 grand. In two years, they probably don't make 75 it's grand, obscene. right? He's giving himself a 75,000 pound on top pay of, rise. On top of how much is he getting? On top of getting? about half a million quid. Yeah. yeah. So he's already making uh, in excess of half a million it's quid. It's utterly obscene. The increase alone is more than double the average national salary. Yeah. Here's my theory on this, mm. and I think you're absolutely right to nominate him. My theory is that there was a quiet gentleman's agreement mm. when he was taken on but really sorry, we can't give you a salary of over 500 grand. We look a bit insensitive when, yeah. we're, we're, when we're asking over 75 to pay the licence fee. To pay the licence fee. Um, so, look, you're going to have to take a, you know, 
be a good chap. Mm. Look as though you're doing the right thing. Take a bit of a cut. Yeah. But nod, nod, wink, wink. We won't put it in the contract, but trust us. You know, we'll we'll give you yeah. a huge rise uh, after a while. So another public con. Happened. Another public yeah, con. I, I, We've been I conned again. Our money's taken and we're conned. I think it's dishonest. I think it's totally out of touch. Uh, I think it's disgraceful. Mm. And I think it's why, frankly, um, the BBC is in its current guise and form should be on its way out. Mm. And maybe, maybe the new culture mm. secretary, um, Nadine well, Doris, that's quite uh, could encouraging, help isn't it? Because she's not a big fan of the BBC. And no, I think, but, but uh, when you see figures what, like something like only six percent of the population trust the BBC as a news organisation, yep. you, you begin to see why. Because they're not a news organisation really anymore. They're this huge corporation employing thousands and thousands of people at ridiculously overinflated salaries who are not doing anything for the ordinary people of this country. What's fascinating about all of the candidates that we've nominated, they're all completely out of touch yep. with what's really going on with millions of families mm. up and down the country. Absolutely. It's quite extraordinary. The SAGE members, Johnson, Starmer, Davey. Mm. I mean, really? Yeah, it's true. Absolutely true. Who's your third one? Oh, comes on from the BBC, doesn't it? It carries Rather on well. with the strict... What's going on at strict? Yes. Uh, you know, firstly, um, I'm not biased in any way, but Nina Wadia must win, cos she's my mate. <laughs> but apart from that... Um, so, there's been this whole... I can't watch it, to be honest. I just find it incredibly tedious. Oh, I'd love... Oh, gosh, it's just the dancing. Anyway, this whole thing about there's three strictly professionals yeah. who have not been vaccinated. Mm. And this argument about the vaccine, honestly, I've, I've, I'm just so tired of having it. My mouth doesn't want to have it anymore. I'm mm. moving those words. If the vaccine works, mm. then you're vaccinated. Why are you bothered yes. what he does? Right. That's the point. Mm. That is the real point of vaccine. So there's this big hoo-ha about who the three professionals yes. are and everyone's piling in saying they should be sacked and all of that stuff. Right. And yet the couple that are not going to be in the competition for the next couple of weeks mm. um, are two fully vaccinated, yes. a professional and uh, the uh, guy from... Oh, yeah, gosh, the guy, what's his from, name? The, what's the guy his, from the band. band, yeah. Oh, my gosh, I'm showing my age now. I don't know who he is. McDuff, no, not McDuff. McFly. 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 It was one of those. Sorry. McDuff was the, uh, the the character in Macbeth. I know. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's very similar. Good band, actually. Good, very good. Very band. good. Yeah. yeah. Great anyway, to, 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 used, so used to do Glastonbury. Fa the fact that they're the two, they're both fully vaccinated, and they've got COVID, so they can't continue with the competition. Madness. Makes me laugh so much because it just completely proves the rubbish of vaccine passports. And you also know that they're not going to be the last, are they? There's going to be Absolutely more. Not. There's going to be another couple next week and another yeah, it, couple. They'll probably have course, to shut it, it all down. Yeah. I mean, it highlights this, the, you know, the utter stupidity of vaccine passports and, and this, this nonsense. And, and it's happening with employers all over the place, getting yeah. themselves in a terrible mm. pickle, completely unnecessarily. Yeah, well, one of the reasons we've been talking about uh, the DVLA in the past few weeks is that there's literally nobody at work. So people who are trying to get HGV licences, yeah. people who are trying to get driving licences of one kind or another... My daughter can't another, get her driving You test. can't get anything out of them. Yeah. You know, I know and, people and who actually used to call them up, but at one point, they just didn't answer the phone. At one point, somebody answered the phone and said, we're very busy, put the phone down. Yeah, you try and get a passport. That's I a mean, civil... The truth is, is productivity in the civil service yeah. has literally collapsed. Mm. Because why? They were working from home. Yeah. And... And uh, also, they, or they might be, you know the whole thing about not just working from home, they're constantly getting COVID because they're self-tested and they've got COVID. It's just very few people who are self-employed um, have yeah, the same amount that, of, of yeah. COVID. Yeah, it's much people are responsible for hitting the public sector in a much bigger way, funnily yeah, enough. Yeah, it really yeah. is. None of whom, of course, have had any risk to their jobs no. uh, at all. No. Uh, over the last 18 months, when the self-employed, um, many of them didn't get any support from the government, from the furlough scheme, mm. disgracefully. Um, and, and these are the people, actually... You know, they're the bedrock of driving activity and creativity uh, across the country. And they're the risk takers mm. of, of, you know, how do I pay the bills this week? How do I pay yeah. to put fuel in the car if there was fuel well, in the petrol this is section? The bit yeah. that people don't seem to understand that without those people, there is no public sector. You know, there is no Department Correct. of Defence, Department of Health, DVLA, Home Office, nothing. Yeah. Passport Office. You know, and there's no HMRC without the people like us and others who contribute tax to keep them all in work. And I've seen myself during lockdown what happened. So, you know, a lot of the kind of big companies uh, or big restaurant groups and things, they were man managing to carry on because mm. they had funds and the banks were more likely to lend to them. Also, because they've got this power, they, they could renegotiate cheaper rents and things like that. But all the small independents, they've all shut down. So I, I advised three, um, three little cafes and restaurants and they've all shut down because yeah. they could not afford to continue in this no. way. So all, all their hopes, their dreams, their life savings have gone. Yeah.
It's unbelievable. It really is. Now, it before really I ask you for your third, I'm just going to uh, carry over. We always carry one over because obviously three threes are only nine. Mm -hmm. We need a top ten. This week is going to be Harry and Meghan. And I have to say, they do get carried over quite a lot, Harry and Meghan. But I mean, could you believe, <laughs> could you believe the clothing uh, allowance that was spent? 87 grand on, I think, three-day trip to New York. Also including a coat at one point that was worth five and a half thousand. It was 27 degrees in Manhattan the day that she wore that coat. This is Meghan. Um, she also wore £300,000 worth of jewellery to visit a primary school in Harlem, which is one of the poorest schools in the country. Um, she regaled them with uh, tales of how uh, it was terrible to be poor uh, while reading from her own book, um, hoping that they might buy a copy. I mean, just incredibly kind of out of touch. We talk about people out of touch it's with class. society, right? It's, um, it's, I mean, it's actually obscene. Mm. Uh, what I found most obscene, regardless of all of that, was the idea that in order for them to visit the memorial, the incredible memorial yeah. that I've seen of the World Trade Centers. Yes. You know, these, these two water fountains. Yes. Yeah. The footprint In the, of the footprint towers. of the towers, yeah. And that they had to close it for anybody else. Yeah. I mean, I just thought that was actually just morally It is disgusting. sick, isn't it? It is and sick. sick. You know, who do these people think they are? Mm. You know. That's the question we always ask when we see those two. That couple. Yeah. When you see them, every time I read them, they're like, who do you think you are? I know. Who do you think you are? How dare you tell me how to live my life and then go and do the exact opposite? I think that's one of the things in society today is the huge hypocrisy. Mm. Just yeah. even with, you know, with all, all of our planks, as it were, the one thing that is, stands out about all of them is they are complete and utter hypocrites. Mm. And Harry and Meghan, yeah. oh my gosh, they're, and and, they're the king and, and, and queen the, the hypocrisy. The hypocrisy always ends up centering around climate change. Yes. You know, because they're all the ones who either, you know, some eco's lunatic sitting on gluing himself to the M25, yes. who hasn't insulated his own home, right. despite telling tens of millions of others <laughs> to insulate their We might be coming on to yeah. them in a bit. And then, and then we've got Harry and Meghan, who fly everywhere, around everywhere in a private jet, mm. despite mm. telling everybody else that they've got to be kind and compassionate yeah. in the environment. And, I mean, it's just uh, They also had the giant uh, petrol-powered uh, V... Eight Range Rover waiting for them as they came out of the. Of course uh, they did. You know, which, which no doubt being being in New York was probably left running all the oh, time yeah. that they yeah. were there. Oh for sure, yeah. Because I mean, you'd have to have because that's know, what they do. She strikes me as a bit of a Stevie Nicks, you know, Madonna type, where you have to have the temperature at twenty one degrees at all times and everything has to be painted white. You know, when Stevie Nicks used to check into hotels, she would make them paint the room because she couldn't stay in a room that wasn't white. Unbelievable. And at one point, I think they had to paint the entire penthouse level of one of the Ritz Carltons in Sydney or something like that because the whole entourage were there. And they had to completely redecorate before she would accept to move in. And you just go, you're only here for two nights. It's wow. just... I mean, you know. But the, the fact This that is the world they live in, though. It is the world they live in, but we're pandering to them. We're pandering to them. And I just don't understand how they look at themselves in the, in the mirror. You know, you look and the, the, the way, the, the hypocrisy, don't they see it? Don't no. they read it? Don't they Very read funny. it? I mean, have they know, having, no self-awareness? Having disappeared halfway across the world for privacy. Mm. <laughs> oh. and, and everything they do is designed to court... Publicity. Well, yeah. they said no pictures, please. They're travelling with their own photographer. Yeah. So, you know, and he's wired up for a documentary series, it would appear. It's all about, so, it's all you know, about we the can cash that they're It's all get. about the cash. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about the publicity on their terms. Yeah. It's absolutely right. So, your third nominee. My third nominee. Now, yes. this, is, this, is, uh, this is slightly unusual. Is it? But I do think that the governor of Her Majesty's Prison mm. on the Isle of Wight uh, deserves, uh, deserves to be a nominee. Oh, yeah. A serious nominee. Yeah. Because this is a prison that is holding, I mean, and has a long history of holding serious criminals, mm. wrong ones. Some very bad people. Bad people. Who craze with Who've made very bad judgments yeah. and done awful things. And um, the governor, now, this is quite serious, because the governor's name is one Mr Doug Graham. <laughs> so we... we, we, we the, the, research, the research is still going on yes. as to where, where in the family tree mm. of, of the Graham family yes. he sits. And it is a big family, because it is it's a, a bit family. like uh, the Greeks. The but, Scots oh, yeah. you have may a need, lot of children. You may <laughs> need to disassociate him. You may need to make sure to. That, that he does not get anything from your will, Mike. Yeah. Because, uh, because this gentleman, in preparation... I have to read this, because I, I couldn't believe it. In preparation for National Inclusion Week... Mm. Yeah, that one passed me by now. Our equalities team have started distributing pronoun badges <laughs> to the not only to the prison warders, but yeah. presumably to, to the, the inmates. inmates. You know, these 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 nice people that are being really. This is a place that first held the Yorkshire Ripper. You must be going right. up to a guy so, like that and going, "What pronoun would you and, like?" To and there's a nice picture on Twitter that people can look at of the six different badges. Oh yeah, and I shall read them out. Okay. Um, if you're not sure, one says, "Ask me." They're a nice purple colour. That's good. Um, oh. Another one says he, they. 
Another one says her they. Mm. Uh, another one says they them. They them. Yep. And another one says him he and she her. I mean, we basically want prisons mm. to be properly run so that they are safe, for, they keep bad people off the streets. Yeah. Um, yes, you know, let's rehabilitate them so that they learn not to re-offend. Yes, that's a huge if, possible. if possible. If possible. Yeah. If, if not, if possible. punish. Um, but, but if not, yes. Um, but the idea that you should be spending loads of taxpayers' cash, think of the time, mm. the committees in the prison that went on, oh, well, what badges are we going to include for National Inclusion Week? What colour should they be? Mm. What font should we use? What yeah. size of font? What should we put on them? You could imagine all this stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just nuts. It is but nuts. The running and it won't theme... be the only place doing it, probably, either. There'll be all sorts of other prisons doing it. You but know. the running theme that we've got in Plank of the Week this week is our cash yeah. that yeah. I work hard yes. for, you work hard for, is being spent on these planks yeah. and they get our money and do what they want with it. I don't agree with having wages over half a million for someone who's running the BBC, no. which I do not trust. It's I mean, a public I do sector not trust. job. I don't think that Missy Redhead here, Clay Rayner, should be spending 250 quid on... I haven't got um, iPods that cost yeah. 200 Well, I have, quid. but I actually bought them myself. Well, I, I don't, well if I can't have them, why does she have them? And, and the, but the point is, it's no surprise, because of all these things, that... The total, ta you know, our taxes basically are now going to be the highest for 70 yeah. years. And the reason is because all of these different people, mm. and we've just talked about, you know, at the tip of the iceberg, but this is going on all through but the public like, sector. All the furlough money, all the government spending on, on COVID, yeah. it's all our money, it's not it's, theirs. Exactly. Really? Right? There's no such thing as government money. No. Right? It's our money, and the government is, is far too often spending it very, very badly. Mm. And these are just some of the, you know, just, just the well, tip of the iceberg. It very, very rarely spends it on where it should be spent. And that's one of the points that we always yes. discuss and on the show And it's Wednesday. not just the actual cash, it's the time they take discussing this mm. nonsense. Right. And, and that, that has a cost to itself. There's an opportunity cost to all this time. And, and that's what just drives mm. me hard. Well, utterly well, mad. The last nomination is not, funnily enough, a public sector organisation. However, it is still costing us a bucket load of money, and it's these wallies from Insulate Britain, right, who <laughs> continually turn up. Now, every time I hear any of them, I won't have them on my show, but every time I hear any of them talking, they're almost always on benefits, right? Now, somebody pointed out to me, if you're on benefits, you're supposed to be available for work at all times. Yeah. So this might be the way to get them, because I'd suggested uh, last week that we should somehow withhold some of their benefits, you know. I don't want them to be homeless and living on the street, but they seem to have plenty of time to demonstrate every single weekday. They don't do it at the weekends for some bizarre reason. I don't know whether they've yeah. got, you know, Saturday jobs or something, but they don't seem to like sitting on motorways any other time apart from Monday to Friday. But, of course, the government brings out this um, injunction to stop them going the M25. So now they're just sitting down in lots of other places, which is costing us an absolute Which fortune. was totally predictable. Why, yeah. in the first injunction they got, they said, right, we're going to injunct this around the whole country. Yeah. It was pretty obvious. If you do the, you injunct them in the M25, they're going to disappear to another motor. I mean, yeah. it just... And every time yeah, they talk, they've got a different the argument. They're breaking the law. Yeah. So why are the police not going and picking them up yeah. and putting them in the van? And when they're to facing pavements and doing all the things that they're doing, they are breaking mm. the law. These things are illegal. It's not right. like normal and protests. It, it I go out, on protests. It turns... I walk. We get permission to go on these protests, and we walk. You we walk, make yeah. a protest. It's moving. That's we, fine. We're not yes. breaking the law. Right. And in fact, it turns out they're breaking multiple laws. Uh, and you know, there are a numerous different laws that they're breaking in their various ridiculous protests. And the police constantly are playing catch up. I still can't believe the policeman who, in one of the videos, says, "I literally, literally said, is everything okay? If you've yeah. got any questions, do ask." Yeah. I mean, get real. I know. Scrape them Absolutely off the ridiculous. scrape them off the road. Yeah. Yeah. Throw them into the side of the pavement. Yeah. I mean, you know, frankly, literally, there are millions of people up and down this country who want to give these people a slap around the face, yeah. a kick up the back. They want to give them a canning and throw them in the canning don't they? I mean, because that's just, what will happen. They should throw them in the in the uh, in the Isle of Wight prison. <laughs> that's, yeah, then they can oh, have their own pronouns. Then they have their own pronouns, yeah. and then they'll see whether they like yeah. it. Well, they could just put them in the clink. You know, there's a very nice prison just down the road from here, is which indeed. is an old-fashioned. Um, sort of from the Middle Ages, where they used to put them in this, uh, this this watery grave, effectively. I'm not suggesting this for a minute in case you take it too seriously, but they used to, the water used to rise uh, as they were in this in this prison, and if the water rose too high, they all drowned. You know, and that was what they thought was justice in those days. You know, it's not far from your restaurant, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another story. But, you know, it, just, it, it seems incredible to me that these people have so much time on their hands, and every time they make an argument, it's something else. You know, they're now demonstrating against people freezing in their homes in winter, and more bogus statistics where they say something like, you know, 28 to 30,000 people last year died because they couldn't afford to heat their homes. Absolute nonsense. It's not true. 
You know, there are plenty of people dying for all sorts of reasons, but it's Absolutely. not because they haven't got enough heat for their homes. It's just nonsense. And it, it needs it, to stop. And it's a, as you said, it's a certain type of person that's there. Yeah. And again, these people are not They're not in contributing touch to society. With, no, they're, with, they're, with they're real not, people they're, they're, that are working. They're, they're, they're takers. Yeah. Um, the only thing is, and I'll sort of play a slight devil's advocate here, you have to admire their, that they've actually been quite smart because they've, they've gained maximum publicity mm. yeah. because of their tactics. Yeah. Um, but we have utterly failed to respond yes. in a proper, firm, robust way immediately. But what they, haven't, but, but they, yeah, but what they haven't had is any success with what it is that they want, supposedly. No, they've actually done... Yeah. Of because course. that will never happen. Yes. Right? And Apart from the fact that, as people have pointed out, there's quite a lot of homes in Britain are insulated already. So you don't have to insulate 29 million. There are quite a lot that are not insulated because they can't be insulated, so you can completely get rid of and, that figure anyway. And there's, there's millions of relatively new homes that have built, been built over the last decade or so that actually are incredibly well insulated. Exactly. Um, so, no, I mean, they've actually done huge harm to their cause, to the cause of climate mm. uh, change, because people are getting more and more sick of this. Yes. They really and are. They're, and, they're, and they're running out of uh, patience. And, and, running and out of patience. People, are, people are really suffering. They can't get to the doctor, to the to hospital mm. appointments. They can't earn a living. And there was an accident. Businesses are struggling. Got, yeah. there's, got there's a woman appears to be badly. seriously injured. Yeah. You know, and yeah, it, but it's it's about the leadership of the police to say we're not tolerating mm. this. You know, know the law, get them off the street immediately, mm. and make sure they don't go back. Absolutely there. right. Well, that's it. Those are our nominations for Plank of the Week this week, and there's an awful lot of them. Now comes <laughs> the hard part, because now what we have to do is choose the winner. So, Richard, it's time for you to tell us your three yes, nominations. Yes, just to clarify, my yeah. nominations are Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, Sir Keir Starmer, Leader of the Opposition, and, of course, uh, Doug Graham, <laughs> the, the Governor of Her Majesty's Prison on the Isle of Wight. Uh, it's just got to be Boris. Boris. It just has to be Boris. Boris. Not just for the reasons you said, but for so, so many So many other reasons, reasons. there it is. Boris Absolutely. hasn't been picked as one of the, one of the contenders for a while. Oh, uh, so, tell us your three. So, mine was the Strictly Lot. Yes. Angela Rayner. Yeah. And also Sage. I think it has to be Angela Rayner. I think this. I think Angela Rayner and yeah. Boris Johnson. So my three then are insulate Britain, uh, of course, as the main uh, protagonist of all of the nonsense that's been going on. Um, I've also um, given you uh, the Fuel Fools, which I think is probably a good one, and also Tim Davy from the BBC. Yes, indeed. I think it has to be the morons from Insulate Britain. I yes. really do. I okay. mean, they've because of the. The, the, the fury and damage they've caused to so many people up and down the country. OK. So, Insulate Britain, Boris Johnson, Angela Rayner. This is a bit where we finally wow. get a winner. I don't know. That's quite tough, isn't it? It is quite tough, but I think because she's so topical and mm. it is, you know, the Labour Party conference, it's got yes. to be Angela. I think that's a good shout. I'm fighting Would for Angela. Would you go with that? Yeah, I think we can go for Angela. OK. Yeah, think... should, we, should we separate the politicians with Insulate Britain in number two position? Boris yes. number three? Yeah. Yes. Sounds like a plan. Yes, that sounds good. Well, in that case, and I haven't been able to do this for a while because we actually now have a proper plank of Look the week. Look at that. Plank of the week. Uh, well done, Angela Rayner. You finally made it. See you next time. <laughs>